All right, in the second part of our first module, we're going to discuss strings. Technically, strings are actually a compound object consisting of a set of characters, but we're going to treat them as if they're basically a, a fundamental data type that we're going to work with. Um, now, historically, when you've represented strings in com on, on a computer, uh, they were represented in terms of this ASCII character set. Uh, why this ASCII character set? What's going on here? Well, in the early days of computers, computers were basically 8-bit devices. That basically means that all of the numbers that the computer was working with were fundamentally uh, numbers between 0 and 255. That's all you could represent in, in one fundamental unit that the computer considered at a time. And computers don't really think about characters. Computers strictly think about numbers internally. Characters are just a representation that it uses to communicate with humans. So uh, they had 256 different values to represent, so they divided those up into numbers which were represent specific symbols. Uh, being first developed in the United States, uh, it was focused on the typical US character set uh, with a little bit of concession to some of the European character sets uh, with a few of these accented characters that you see over here. Uh, basically, the first 32 characters in the character set are special values. They're things like tabs or carriage returns or line feeds, that sort of thing. Special meanings, they're not actually printable characters on the screen. Uh, you get into the next block here and then you have things like the numbers and some of the symbols. Then the next couple of blocks are basically the uh, alphabet and uppercase and lowercase. Then you have some of these special characters in the second half of the, of the ASCII character set. Uh, but this was really all you could represent using this ASCII character set. These are the only characters that you could create. Now, of course, computers have become a lot more international, uh, and later on was developed this Unicode uh, system. Now, I'm not showing you the entire Unicode character set. It's much, much larger than this, but basically Unicode was uh, an attempt to internationalize computers a little bit more uh, and has a much, much larger uh, range of potential characters. There are several hundred thousand characters in the, in the Unicode uh, dictionary now, I believe. Uh, so basically with Unicode, you could represent any conceivable character that you, you might need to represent. Uh, the downside, of course, is that uh, ca individual characters are no longer necessarily one of these 8-bit uh, numbers that goes from 0 to 256. Now there's a much larger pool of values. How do we represent strings in the computer? How do we tell Python that we're representing a string in the computer? So we'll go back to our Jupyter Lab session here, uh, and we'll try typing something like double quotation marks. This is a test, and executing it. And you'll see what we get back are single quotation marks. It turns out that Python actually has four different ways of representing a string when you, when you type it to the language. Uh, one is you can start and end the string with double quotation marks. Exactly equivalent to that is starting and ending a string with single quotation marks or apostrophe characters. Note that this is not a forward apostrophe and a back apostrophe, and this isn't forward quote double quotation marks and backwards double quotation marks. This is just the fixed double quotation marks and the fixed apostrophe character. Uh, those other special characters, those those Unicode characters, which represent the the other thing, uh, the 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 curved quotation marks are not compatible with Python. You have to use the, these quotation marks or these, you know, th that single quotation mark. Um, so I could have equivalently have typed, this is test with single quotation marks and it would have produced exactly the same thing. Uh, why did Python do that? Uh, there are a couple of sort of excuses for it, but there isn't really a terrific reason that I'm aware of. Uh, one thing is if you want to do something like, if you want to say something like, uh, that can't be true, and you do it with single quotation marks, obviously it's going to fail because this it can, part of the contraction ended the string, so then this becomes this dangling bit and it's, it, you can't interpret it, so you get a syntax error. Whereas if we do exactly the same thing with double quotation marks, then I can type it. But there are other solutions to that problem, so that isn't really a very good excuse for why they, why they did it that way. Uh, the only other thing uh, that you can do, that I said there were four type ways of expressing a string. The, the other way of expressing strings are with triple double quotation marks and triple single quotation marks, and I'll explain that. Uh, so let's say you want to uh, declare a string that spans multiple lines. So this is a first line, uh, and then I'd say this is a second line. That is actually invalid syntax for Python. If you declare a string with single quotation marks, it has to fit within one line. 
Now there are tricks you can use to make multi-line strings. There's a special character which is backslash followed by n, which will put a new line in the middle of your string uh, and, and uh, allow you to accomplish uh, multiple line strings with, with single quotation marks. But if you do it with triple quotation marks, then you can just type it in a very natural sort of way. Uh, and you can have as much as you want between the triple, uh, triple sing, uh, quotation marks. Uh, you can do it with triple single quotation marks or triple double quotation marks, and it works exactly the same way. Okay, great. We can now define strings. Uh, another important thing uh, about variables in Python, so we learned about simple variables where I said, for example, before a is equal to 5, and then I can get 5 back from a, just like in normal mathematics. Uh, but you can also assign strings to variables or any other type of data object. So I can say a is equal to uh, this is a test. And now a is equal to this is a test. Now I've got a and b. And I can do things with a and b. I can say a plus b. And I'll get the concatenation of the two strings, a plus b plus b. Uh, you can actually do multiplication as well. I can say b, b times 3, and it will replicate the string b three times. Uh, now, division doesn't do anything. It doesn't have, really make any sense. Uh, and subtraction doesn't do anything either. But you can do addition and multiplication with strings, uh, simple operations. Another important operation that you can do with strings is get substrings out of strings. So if I have a string, this is a test, and I want to pull out the middle of the string, I can say, uh, or, or if I want to pull out a single character, let's start with that. If I say a and use square brackets with zero inside, that'll give me the first character of the string. Now this is an important thing. Python numbers things starting with zero, not one. So the first element in any sequential object is always element number zero. Uh, so if I say element number one, uh, I'll get h, the second letter in the string, and so on. You can also use negative values. So if I say negative 1, it will give me the last value in the string. Negative 2, the second from last value, and so on. Um, there is a little bit more to the slicing. So uh, if I just put a single number inside the, the uh, square brackets, then I'll just get out a single character. If I say uh, 1 colon 4, I will now get out starting at the first character number, you know, starting at character 1, h, and going until, but not including, the fourth character, right? So the beginning number it includes, but the final number it goes up until, but then stops. Uh, and this is something else that you'll see sort of throughout Python. There's, there's some very good reasons for doing it that way. Just remember that the first number is inclusive and the second number is exclusive. So uh, I can get a range of, of, of values out in substrings. I can also use uh, negative values in there. So I could say 1 colon minus 1, and that will uh, omit the first and last characters from the string. Okay, uh, one last thing that you can do. Uh, if you put another colon and put a value after that, that will allow it to jump through the string. So it will take uh, start at the first number, go until the second from the last number, uh, and skip every other character. So it'll basically go H, skip 1, S, skip 1, I, like you can see down here. Uh, so that allows you to span things. So basically there are three values you could put in there. Uh, technically, you can leave any of those values out. If I say a, and I just say colon minus, minus 1 colon 2, uh, the omitted value, the, 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 the value I left out there, uh, becomes 0, basically. And if I leave out the number here, then it goes to the end. Um, if I leave out the number here, that doesn't really make much sense. All right, so uh, we now understand how to get substrings out of our strings. There are other things we can do with strings as well. Uh, there are so-called operators. So again, I have my string. This is a test. I can say uh, a dot, and this is how, how you specify an operator. It's very much like a function, but it's specified by, by taking the name of the object, dot, and then the name of the function. Then it will apply it to the object, which is a. So I'll say a dot find is, oops, sorry is. 
and you see it gave me a 2. Why did it give me a 2? Because my is is here? Well, oh, look, there's an is in this. So 0, 1, 2. So it tells me the location of the first is that it found in the string. If I say r find instead of find, it will instead give me the last value, the location of the last value, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. You can see it there. Uh, now, though, it's still counting from the front, but it's looking from the back. Uh, now, there is no way using find or r find to skip values. So if, it, if I had three is is in here, I, would, oh, I can only find the first one and the last one. There are other strategies you can use to find all of the instances of something within a string, but we'll be talking about that much later. In. Okay, uh, next operation on strings, uh, count. You can tell Python to count all of the instances of some substring within the string. So there are two i's in the string. There are three s's in the string. I can also tell it to count substrings, not just individual characters, so it'll, there are two is's in the string. Uh, so that's a very useful thing that you can use to efficiently count things within the string. The next operation that we can do with strings is replace things. So let's say I want to replace all of the instances of is with the single character x. I can do that. Now I like to point out that this doesn't change a. What, I, what happened when I said a.replace is with x is it returned a new string where is had been replaced with capital X. It did not change the original string. The original string is still exactly what it was before. Indeed, strings in Python are immutable. They can't be changed in any way. If you want to get a string that has been modified in some way, you have to make a new string which has the modification contained in it. And there are some reasons why that's done that way, uh, but uh, that is always true of Python strings. Uh, there are some other methods that you can use with strings, but we'll get to those a little bit later once we've introduced some of the other data types in the next module.